So if you wonder how I got here, the answer is I talk about open source and I talk about values a lot on X or Twitter or whatever you called it. Kelsey has left Twitter, but before he left Twitter, a lot of times what happens is somebody does some shenanigans in open source and then someone else sends up like a weird Twitter bat signal and goes, what does Adam think about this topic? And then I wax philosophic about it and sound really smart and then y'all engage with it, which makes me do it again because of dopamine and here we are. And then someday Kelsey DMs you and is like, give this talk and you're like, okay. Okay, so then my relationship to fair source, which uh, if, if you came here hoping to learn more about fair source, is that I was like the call to adventure for fair source. So what happened was Sentry open sourced, put some software under a fair source license, and then they wrote a blog post about how they open sourced everything. And I was like, uh-uh, no, that is not what that means. And they were like, it's what we want it to mean. And I was, can I swear at KuCon? I haven't checked into it. I give a fuck what you think it means. We did work here and we decided what it meant. And they were like, but those are just words. And I'm like, they're not just words, they're values. And you are not going along with those values. And if you have a different set of values, my friends, I beg of you, please, for the good of all, just say so. Just say what your values are. And other people who also have your values, they're gonna show up, they're gonna like your game, they're gonna wanna do it like you do. And then you don't have to get, get me yelling at you about how you're not a good enough free software hippie. Yeah? And I would rather you were a free software hippie, but if you're not, great. But just don't come to me telling me you are while you're picking my pocket. Okay. Ooh, TLDR, this is the whole talk in one slide. These slides are full of words. That's because I expect you're gonna have a lot of questions because basically I've got 20 years of, of insight that I've been, I've got hundreds of pages in notebooks, handwritten, trying to describe how this stuff works. This is the first time I've ever tried to distill it to, to it all. Um, so please don't over index. Uh, I'll put the slides up, you can use them later. TLDR, free software is a political movement. Open source takes free software's politics, removes them, and says, you know what's good? Open development models. It's good for business. And so that's cool. So, you, so we take values, we remove the values, we get open source. Fair source, we remove any abstract idea of open development models, and we go, I like the open part where you do stuff for me, but mostly I like it when I get paid. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw that. I don't know. Okay, so look, what should you do? Um, it's back, woohoo. Okay, I just gotta touch it more often. That's what needs to happen. Okay, um, I'm gonna stay closer. Um, it's not weird unless you make it weird. Okay, uh, so what should you do? Look, TLDR, you can leave the talk right now if you want to. Number one, build a product that has great product market fit. Most of you won't. You're gonna, I, I didn't, I've built eight different products in my life. One had product market fit. One out of eight. I'm really good at what I do. I'm great at it. I'm probably better than you at infrastructure. I'm just saying, I'm good at it. One, yeah? Eight, it's tough business. Two, do not give what you build away for free. This is just a dumb idea. If you're like, I want to make a bunch of money, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build something highly valuable and I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to give it to you for nothing. Then later I'm going to ask you for some money. How do you think that's going to go? It's going to go bad. It goes badly. It goes bad. It goes bad. It does. It goes bad. I ask you for money. You're like, I don't want to pay you money. And then I'm like, okay, but you can download it on the website. You're like, thanks. That's what happens. It just is. Don't do it. Don't give it away for free. Should you open source your stuff? If you have a disruptive new thing, you can use open source to control the competitive environment and to grow faster. This is great. You want to be a great upstream, you want to take the most money. I'll tell you how in a hot second. If you want to do fair source, fine. You do it because you want the benefits of some kind of winky open development model, right? You want to let people kind of see the source code cool, but you don't want any competition on your own software. That's why you're going to choose to do that. Okay. That's the whole talk, you can leave, but don't, because it's fun. So we're gonna talk first about philosophy and values, because I think if you wanna understand the spectrum, you have to understand where we're coming from. So here's how it starts. Software is infinite by nature. And it's in many ways unique in the history of humanity that it has this property. If you have compute and power, and I give you a copy of some software, nothing happens to the copy of what I have. I lose nothing. Right? If I baked bread and gave everybody in here a piece of bread, I'd have no more bread. Right? This is true 
of everything that has ever existed in the history of humanity, Kelsey pointed out to me earlier today, except maybe music. Well, maybe, but let's give it to music. But otherwise, this is pretty much unique in the history of the universe. This is a crazy thing to realize. If you haven't realized it yet, this is, it's just true. It is the nature of software. And if you take that idea and you go, what does that mean for the future of humanity and for the idea of human freedom, what you get is free software, right? This is what Richard Stallman realized. This is where the free software movement comes from. It says, we shouldn't use software simply to extract value from the people who use it because by nature, the software doesn't require us to. And this could change the fundamental nature of who we are as people and how we relate and how the economy functions. And instead, software should empower users to control their own lives in service of their needs and wants. If it's an infinite resource and the sharing gives, subtracts nothing, then what we need to do is use it to better our own individual lives with no restrictions other than the joy in helping each other grow and learn. The four freedoms are the core tenets of free software, and they enshrine this point of view. This is a radical political philosophy. This is crazy. This is Star Trek shit, right? Like, it's, like, it's way out there, right? And it has terrifying implications to business, yeah? Because if, if, if I just give you the stuff, and then you do what you want with it, what do you not do? Pay me, that's right, because it's free. And the entirety of the world economy is based on the idea that resources are scarce. And if what you build with your little fucking hands isn't scarce, no one buys it. It's crazy. It's crazy person talk. And so they were like, how are we going to get businesses to let us get more free software? And that is the open source initiative. Because open source takes all that political philosophy Star Trek stuff, rips it out, and goes, you know what's awesome? Open development models. It's collaboration, my friends. That, that is the key. If we build software together, we do, we build better businesses, the software gets better, all bugs are shallow. And the infinite nature of software is actually good for business because it creates higher quality software, better reliability, greater flexibility, lower cost, and no predatory lock-in. Yeah? And then they give you a big list of all the things you have to do in order to ensure that this open development model can survive and thrive. Notice what's not on the list. Freedom. The future, the nature of software. The future of how human beings will relate to each other in a technological world when we're post-economic. Yeah? That's on purpose, because they didn't want all that garbage, because when they said it to your boss, it freaked them out. And they were like, Microsoft's eating our lunch. How are we going to get browsers to win? And they were like, well, it's open development models, you know? OK. Open source is so successful at doing this that you no longer need to know what it means. It just happens for you. It's in the water. It's fluoride. You don't know that you're having fluoride. You're just hanging out, using open source all day. Raise your hand if you think you know what open source is and how it works. Everybody who's not raising their hand knows that I'm going to make fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You actually do know. Um, respect. OK. Most of you don't know, right? Because for you, mostly, it just means it's on GitHub. I can do what I want with it. Life goes on, right? That's because we've very successfully subtracted values from the equation, right? Fair source goes even further. It says, I like the open development model part where I get lots of users who use my product for free and sometimes fix bugs. I like that part. I like the part where uh, when I'm going to a large enterprise and trying to sell it, and they go, what happens if you go out of business? I go, well, you got the source code. And they're like, good answer. I like those parts. I don't like the parts where other people make money on the thing that I build. I like that scarcity thing you removed back in the free software part of the talk. And I'd like some of it back. Because I don't want any competition. Because I wrote the software. It belongs to me. It's for me. So what are their rules? It's publicly available to read, to read. What matters is that you get to look at it. Congratulations. Uh, you get to allow use, modification, and redistribution with minimal restrictions, just a little, to protect the producer's business model. 
i.e., I get paid. It's scarce, right? And then finally, we undergo delayed open source publication because we do actually like the open development model and if it didn't undergo some delayed open source thing, you would call it what it is, proprietary software. Yeah? So, fair source, good on them. Like they told you what it was, I'm glad they did it. Do I like it? Not particularly, because I am a free software hippie. If you hadn't figured that out yet, I believe. Um, so fair source embraces open development while also ensuring that all the ducats go to one place. That's it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it makes software scarce again for a limited time. Uh, how many people know how patents work? This is what patents do. Free software, this is basically patents for free software, right? It says, for a little while, I get all the benefit. Then later, maybe you can have some. It's so later that it doesn't matter, right? Terraform's delayed open source is four years. How many of you run four-year-old software? Better not be anybody, this guy. I'm so sorry, right? What's up, homie? Rel6, okay. Look, here's the chart. Uh, free software on the left, political philosophy, open source, development models. It's about open development. It's good, but it shares values. It shares the same values as free software. It does. It just doesn't talk about them because they're messy. And then finally, fair source is basically traditional business with a little open development model squeezed in on the side. Okay. What's this mean for business and for you and choosing? Because Kelsey wrote this abstract and he was like, how do you choose? And so here's how you choose. First off, you've got to have a strategy. They talked about this a second ago. Strategy is how we align our unlimited aspirations with our limited resources across time, space, and scale. This is the best definition of strategy you will ever hear. It's the only one you need. You're going to go out, you're going to read like good strategy, bad strategy. You're going to read a whole bunch of books about business strategy. They're going to give you stories. Fuck them. That's it. That's strategy. That's the one you want. Okay. Open source and fair source are tactics. Free software is too, I suppose. They're part of the strategy, but y'all call them business models. I swear to God, I've been touching this thing. Um, um, I really have. Um, y'all call them business models, but they're not business models, but uh, I lost the argument. That ship has sailed. Um, so we're gonna call them business models. I tried not to, but that's life. You gotta have product market fit. If you don't have product market fit, which I define as when your customers pull your product to them, I'm no longer pushing it onto the market. I don't have to go tell you. Right now, System Initiative, my company, which I love, does not have product market fit. How many people in this room can't wait to use System Initiative? Thank you, because you love me. But not because you've actually, not because you've used it enough to be like, yes, right? Because there's no product market fit there yet. There's the promise of product market fit, amazing. And I, but I'm gonna push it onto the market for a minute, then later it's gonna pull me. That's when I know I have it. If you don't have that, Everything I'm telling you here doesn't matter. Your job, product market fit. Go get it. Okay, business modeling. In order to work this out, you gotta know how to do some strategy. In order to do that, you need to understand how to do business models. You do not have an MBA. My venture capital friends who were up here earlier, most of them don't either. I, I hate to say it, but mostly they do you wrong when we talk about these words. So, let's talk about total addressable market. Total addressable market, this is like, Basic business modeling, you know, like year one MBA program stuff. It's the maximum size of the market given no limitations on your product or your ability to sell it. So uh, let's say that you sell coffee. Your total addressable market is every human being on the planet Earth over the age of eight, and that's it, right? So that's the maximum size. That's the left-hand side of the equation. The right-hand side is the average price they pay for coffee, yeah? So if you sell coffee at five bucks a coffee, there's 4.6 billion people in the world, your total addressable market is 4.6 billion times five. That is the maximum amount of money you could ever make if you saturated the market. If every coffee drinker on earth was like, I'm drinking Adam Jacob brand coffee, right? Think about Tam, it doesn't really grow. And you hear this a lot in startups, they'll be like, I grew my total addressable market. And when they hear that now, I get mad. Cause I'm like, y yes, how? You can do more people, more, there's 375 million companies on earth. Did you, did you shit out another 100 million? What'd you do, right? You didn't, right? You didn't. It's basically fixed in size. The thing you can mostly control in this equation is the right-hand side of the equation. You can control average selling price, ASP. You can control how much they pay. 
but you can't really control how many of them there are. Does that make sense? Okay, two, serviceable, addressable market. Now, this is how big it is given the limitations of your product today. The reason most of you don't use System Initiative yet is because my SAM is too small, right? The number of people who can use System Initiative, small. The, it's the one percenters, right? It's the very best of you that can use System Initiative today. If you're not in that list, you can't use it yet. You just can't. It's okay, it's fine, it's fine. I'm coming for you, I'll get to you later. I'm gonna grow my SAM, right? So there's too many things. Back to coffee, your SAM would probably be constrained by say the places you have, uh, by geography, right? Where do I have a coffee shop, right? Suddenly that really shrinks you down. I only sell coffee in Salt Lake City. Whew. Smaller SAM, right? But the same thing on the right-hand side, average selling price. Last thing, serviceable, obtainable market. I sell coffee in Salt Lake City. Who else sells coffee in Salt Lake City? How many people am I gonna get out of the total number of people in Salt Lake City who drink coffee? And how many of them are gonna buy my coffee, realistically? That's my serviceable, obtainable market. How many can I win? Again, times the average selling price. Pricing and packaging is how we determine average selling price. So the pricing model is how you charge a customer. Usage-based, seat-based, perpetual, subscription, whatever. Packaging is how you bundle stuff up to determine the actual price, yeah? System initiative is usage-based, that's my pricing model, according to concurrent resources under management. My monthly package costs seven, I think, one thousandths of a penny. I'm so bad at arithmetic, I don't know if it's hundreds or thousandths. I think it's thousandths? I should know, I'm the CEO. Um, I'm looking at Natalie, because she's a venture capitalist, and she's like, it's thousands. Um, or she's like, it's hundreds. I don't know, but she does, so ask her later. Okay, but there's stuff I don't include, right? If you need SAML at your enterprise, right, then you can't use my monthly plan, and you gotta pay me more. I'm gonna jack the price up on you, right? Raise my ASP, okay. Licensing, products get licensed between producers and consumers. I build a thing, I'm gonna license you to have it, right? Two kinds of licensing, source code licensing, that's the license on the software itself, MIT licensed, GPL, Apache licensed. Second kind of licensed, distribution licensing. When I take that software and give it to Nathan Harvey, I give it to him also under a different license, that's the distribution license. Sometimes those licenses are the same. When they are, we call it license in, license out. But uh, in a lot of cases, they aren't. So I'm gonna give you some good examples of splitting those two things, but they're not the same. You think they are, you're wrong. I'm about to show you numbers. These are somewhere between imprecise and bullshit, but usually the revenue is true. So usually I'm using public revenue numbers and I'm backing in to Tam and Sam based on those revenue numbers. I'm not off by an order of magnitude which makes us fine for the strategic conversation. Okay, let's do Office 365. How many people use Google Workspaces? How many people use Office 365? Great, you're gonna prove my point. Thank you, Room. Office 365 is a proprietary piece of software. It's also distributed under proprietary license. They sell you an annual subscription. They package it up for the home and for the business. You can buy either way. The TAM, let's call it four billion people on Earth right? Everybody over the age of 12 and under the age of 80 is probably in the rough total addressable market for this. Office 365 costs on average 80 bucks. Therefore, the maximum amount of money they could ever make is $320 billion. That's it. Uh, what's the SAM? Well, you know, maybe there's some features they don't support, some languages they don't do well, those sorts of things. Let's say it cuts a billion people. Off of, off of the TAM. But it's pretty mature software, so it's pretty close to saturation. So 240 billion is the, is the market that if everyone who could use it bought it. So then their obtainable market, the actual market they have, is 687 million users at 80 bucks a pop, which is a $55 billion business. That's how much they make. They thankfully give us their actual revenue number. Office has a 33% share of the market. Google has a 44% share of the market. Raise your hand if you think Google makes more money than Microsoft on Office software. None of you do. Google makes, they don't say, let's call it somewhere between 15 and $20 billion on their 44% share. They roll that all into Google Cloud revenue so they can be number three with a bullet, yeah? Okay, 
Let's talk about Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat's source code is all GPL v2. Uh, its distribution license is exclusively the Red Hat end user license agreement. The pricing model is per server subscription. They package it under an enterprise EULA. There's about 50 million servers or so on the planet. So the TAM, right, and oh, and they sell it at $878 roughly per seat. It actually varies from about 500 bucks to like $1,500 if you just like whip that meter all the way to the right. But let's call it 878 between friends. So that's $43.9 billion of TAM. The SAM is, let's call it 30 million, where like it just doesn't make sense for whatever reason. Um, so 26 billion is their, their, their SAM. Their SOM today, actually not today, 2019, they've been growing since then, is $3 billion. That's how much money they make. 3.5 million times 878. RHEL holds less than 1%, less than 1% of the global Linux market. Less than 1%. How many people here bought a RHEL license this year? That dude, 1% of you. Three billion dollars. Let me say it again. Let's just, let's just, let's just, how about you say it? Three billion dollars with the B. Guess what there is not, my friends? There is no version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux you can get for free. You can't do it. There's no zero. There's only 878. Canonical makes Ubuntu. How many people in this room use Ubuntu? Hell yeah. You know why? Ubuntu has a 33% market share globally of all Linux distributions. They have a source license of GPL. They have a distribution license of the GPL. Their license in, license out. Their pricing model is subscription. Their packaging is support and compliance. What is the TAM of Canonical? Well, it's 50 million, right? So we got 50 million servers, same as Red Hat. Whoa. Um, our TAM is 50. That's so bad. Don't look at that. You're going to have a seizure. Um, okay, so your TAM is 50 million. Your SAM is, let's call it 30, exact same as Red Hat. The SOM is 9 million because if you look at Canonical's subscription prices, the vast majority, how many of you pay for a subscription for, for Ubuntu, a pro subscription? Ubuntu Pro? Anybody? Anybody? You know what they charge? The exact same price Red Hat charges. They do. But you know what they have? A 33% market share. Guess what you pay? Zero dollars. You know what that does to the average selling price of Canonical? It puts it in the toilet. 878 to 20, what did I say it was? $27. $27. It's insane. They have a 33% share of the market. They sell it for nothing. It's a terrible business. Would you rather be Ubuntu or would you rather be Red Hat? And before I gave you this talk, I bet everybody in this room, if it was an anonymous survey, would have been like, Ubuntu with a bullet. Red Hat's going to die. No one uses REL. Meanwhile, Red Hat's over there with that fucking Scrooge McDuck money doing little back swimmings, and you're all talking about how open core is the future. What are we doing? We've lost our collective goddamn minds. It's insane. You can tell I've been worked up about it for a decade, right? You have no idea the amount of release I'm getting right now. It's weird. Okay, let's talk about HashiCorp and Terraform. Proven market, growing quickly, everything's fantastic, but they're in a situation roughly like Canonical and it's my fault. It is, because Chef and Puppet, we had two competitors, BladeLogic and Opsware, both of them had over a billion dollars in revenue. Their ASP was 10 times what we sold it at. I put it in the tank. I canonicaled the fuck out the configuration management market. And my friends, my company did not go public. Yeah? It did not. It did not. And so what's happening now is HashiCorp and Terraform, they, found, they figured out another product. They were like, we need another home run. They made eight different products. They got two home runs, a couple base hits. Those two home runs combined got them to public markets at a fraction, a fraction of the size of a lot of great enterprise software companies. But now they have a problem. They got this low ASP that's dragging down their number. And so they have 3,240 customers in Q1. They have easily 10 times, 20 times that. I got five minutes left. I'm going to go long. Um, okay, look, low ASP plus competitive pressure. 
not fun. So they changed their license. Because what they started to see was they had to compete with Pulumi, they had to compete with the CDK, they had to compete with other people for vault money. Now what do they have left? They look at those people that were making money on Terraform and they go, I don't like that. And so they changed the license to the BUSL, right? So that they could compete because they have to do something because that low ASP pressure is killing them. Because they didn't actually solve that ASP problem, they're actually now open coring themselves even with the business source license. They're putting new features that you still can't get even if you use the, the business source licensed code. That's because they have to, because they mostly give it to you for nothing. How many people pay for Terraform? None of you. One sad guy back there. It's awful. Think about the penetration they have. Oh, it hurts. And I did it to them. I did. I did. I did. I was wrong. I'm sorry. HashiCorp chose to force competition rather than segment the market because they already anchored the ASP. They don't have a choice. And if your big business, when you're in a public market, is minting hits, you know what I mean? Is finding product market fit? Ooh, you're somewhere between in trouble and fucked. Because it's really hard to build a product that has great product market fit. It's so hard. All right, Kubernetes. Google open sourced it. Superstar. We're at KubeCon, right? You, once again, let's talk about the magic of selling things for money. Red Hat's OpenShift. How many people use OpenShift? <laughs> that guy. That guy, two people in this room use OpenShift. They have a 1.14% share of the total container market. You know how much they mint in revenue? $1 billion. 1.14% share. That's insane. You know what they do differently than every startup you know? They sell that shit for money. <laughs> so what are you going to do when you leave this talk? Say it with me. Yes. What are you not going to do? Don't give, it away for free. give it away for free. Don't do it. You could get 1.19% of the market and be worth a billion dollars. You don't even really have to win. You just have to be good. It's so much easier. Okay. Red Panda. This was a smart use of the BUSL, except they gave it away again. They fair cord themselves. They were like, oh, if we're going to get you to use Red Panda instead of Kafka, even though it's better technically on every vector, I have to give it away for free. Ugh. Again, right in the crapper, right? So bad. Sentry, the people who started the fair source movement. This was a pretty good reason, actually, because what they had was competitive pressure in a very crowded segment. They sell into the application performance monitoring market. It's really crowded. There's multiple big winners. They're growing. They had a larger competitor, good at open source, was going to just take their code and roll it up into their product, and it was going to make life very hard for them. And so they were like, uh-uh. This was a pretty solid strategic move. Right? Because it's not like they were at the top of the market. It's not like Sentry was going to become the de facto standard for application performance monitoring. Right? They just needed to make it so that they, so that they didn't get robbed and nobody could pick their pocket. It was pretty smart. Docker. You just heard Scott talk about it. What they didn't do was give you numbers. You know what happened in that transition from not selling for money to selling for money? They went from 11 million in revenue to $135 million in two years. I slugged it out at Chef for basically 15. We got into the upper 70s. Two years, $135 million. My friends, what are you going to do? Yes. Linkerd, I think William's in this crowd. October, they're going to die. It's all going bad. They've been slugging it out. They've got a great service mesh. Company's going to go under. There'll be no more Linkerd. The community's all mad. They're like, what will happen? What will we do if we don't have releases? He sells that shit for money. He stops giving it to you for free. He's still giving it to you for free. He's just saying you have to do your own QA. It's the most reasonable thing you ever heard in your life. They go from about to close the doors to growing profitable and in control of their destiny because he sold that shit for money. A special note on competition. All businesses that are successful will have competition. You cannot avoid it. Your reward for product market fit is competition. That's it. Fair source is a good tactic to remove competitors to compete with you on your own product. 
That's what it's for. It's good at it. Open source embraces those same competitors in order to make the software more of a de facto standard in the market. This is very effective. Kubernetes. Why wasn't it Docker? Docker wanted to sell it to you for money and refused to share. And so at Google, Microsoft, Amazon, we're like, OK, if you don't want to share, we won't share. <laughs> Here we are, right? We're not at DockerCon. We're at KubeCon, right? Very effective market strategy. If you do this for your own company, you want to be the high ASP offering in the market. You want to segment. You want to say, look, I'm the upstream. I'm the goodness. I'm where this comes from. If you want it from the experts, you pay me. And you pay me the most. Everybody else's job is to be Google to your Microsoft, right? You'll be thrilled. If you have a $55 billion business unit and Kelsey has a $15 billion on a 44 share, I'll high five Kelsey in the hallway all day, every day, twice on Sunday, and so will he. We'll both be stoked. All right, what's the best business strategy? License in, license out is dumb. Don't do it. Don't do it. We've proven it. Even the companies who win don't win as big as they should. I'm, I'm talking shit about HashiCorp. They got to public markets. It's incredible. Canonical, incredible. You should be so lucky. What incredible pieces of victory those companies are. What brilliant people built them. I love them. They are my friends. They did a great job. They did better than me. And they run ridiculously inefficient public businesses. It's, it's crazy person talk. If you use open source, you want to be the top of the market. If you have competitive pressures you cannot avoid, fair source it, but do not give it away for free. You're going to want to. You're going to be like, let's gain market share. And I'm going to be like, mm-mm, mm-mm. Because the right-hand side of that equation is the only one you can really move. Yeah, you can't move that left-hand side of TAM, but you can sure move the right-hand side. It's TLDR. Free software is a political movement. Open source, just development model. Fair source, little development model, mostly normal software. Most users just care about getting things for free. They don't care about your political philosophy. Startups use open source to cause rapid growth and share, but they drop their ASP to zero, and that causes them, even when they win, to do worse. What should you do? You should build a product with great product market fit. You should not give it away for free. You should open source it if you can. And if you're too worried about competition, feel free to fair source it. But again, don't set that ASP to zero, because now you're fair coring yourself. And that's just dumb. I'm going to ask you just one question before we get ready for the next talk. Fantastic talk, by the way. I think a lot of people hear this and say, hey, look, that's great when you have a lot of runway and you can build something where you can eventually do these things. From a concrete action standpoint, what does that mean? Is it, do we hold the executable binaries and logos and yeah. do I have two different websites? What should they do to yeah, you avoid can, you giving can, it away for free yeah. before they run out of cash? Yeah, you could do it a bunch of different ways. The simplest way is just to not distribute it under the same dis license that you have the source code under and then use pricing and packaging to set the terms. So if what you want is, um, like I'll use system mission as an example. I run a SaaS. Uh, and what we do is give away 100 concurrent resources for free. That's enough to run a production environment in. You don't, you don't have to pay me. You can run production without paying me because that's what I want you to do. Um, and I can just package it up that way, and you get the $0 thing. The number of people who come to me and go, oh, but is that, how free is it? They, they just don't ask, right? Because they don't care. What they care about is, could I get it for free? Could I click the download button? How many people run VS Code? Keep your hand up if you think it's open source. Yeah, exactly. This guy made a face, and he made the right face because the software is open source, but the distribution license is not. It's under a Microsoft proprietary distribution license. They put the telemetry in there. They do whatever they want to do. That's cool. You don't mind because it's free. Because when you go to the website, you click the little download button. So use, build the dynamics you want through pricing and packaging, not through license in, license out, which is what everybody will tell you to do. Everybody will be like, well, just put the Apache license on it, then they download it for free, bada bing, in, out, done. This is terrible advice. I'm sorry that we gave it to you. Don't do it anymore. Change that distribution license, be happy. And if, if you get to be so lucky that you have product market fit and then the market explodes, let someone else offer a license in, license out version of it. See also VS Codium. 
right? All my Debian users out there know what I'm talking about. And that's great. You don't mind, because then you're just still getting share, right? And that's easier, Sam, to compete for, because the people who are using it are already using your software. And you're like, well, but don't you want to get it from the people who are the best in the world at it? And you'll be like, I do. I, I do want that. And then most of them will pay you, and then you're Red Hat and not Canonical. 